Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Catherine Olin, Programs Manager at the American Library in Paris. We're delighted to have you here for another virtual edition of our Evenings with an Author program. For those of you who are just discovering the American Library, we're an independent nonprofit institution in the heart of Paris, and we are proud to be not only the, the largest lending library on the European continent, but also a vibrant cultural center and event space. So for the time being, we have moved to Zoom. Thank you for making that leap and transition with us throughout this past year. It's lovely to see your continued engagement with our programs, even online. Um, 2020 wasn't all bad for us, actually. We were able to celebrate our centennial. So we turned 100 last year. We had mm -hmm. a centennial gala celebration in October, and many of you may have been there, actually. It was a wonderful celebration. And we're looking for, forward to a brighter year ahead in 2021 as well. You can learn more about us on our homepage, as well as uh, the various social media channels. We're on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and we do have a YouTube channel that has all of our recent evenings with an author programs. So I'll introduce tonight's speaker then. Professor Lord Laird is a labor economist who has worked for most of his life on how to reduce unemployment and inequality. He is also one of the first economists to work on happiness, and his main current interest is how better mental health could improve our social and economic life. He is founder director of LSE's Center for Economic Performance and is the co-director of the Center's Program on Community Wellbeing. In 2005, he wrote Happiness, Lessons from a New Science, which was published in 20 languages. He continues to find significant effects of relative income on happiness and to emphasize the importance of non-income variables on aggregate happiness. In 2018, he co-authored a book called The Origins of Happiness, The Science of Well-Being Over the Life Course. And his latest book, about which we'll be, speak we'll be having a conversation this evening, is Can We Be Happier? Evidence and Ethics, which was published in 2020. And those are, those are behind me, as you saw, and also the, the link, if you'd like to purchase uh, this top book, Can We Be Happier, also went out in that email that I sent around this evening. So Richard, thank you so much for being here. I'm just absolutely delighted to be speaking with you. I've been a fan for over a decade now. And just thank you for bringing your, your research and your work to our community, first of all. Well, um, it's lovely to be with you. I just wish I actually was with you. Um, uh, <laughs> Or if I, that, that I was in Paris, at least, which would have been a very, very nice place to be locked down, I think. Um, th this, is, this is a book with a mission, of course, um, because I, I want to see a happier world. Um, and I think we're not going to get a happier world unless we're very clear that that is what we want. That's the priority. Um, so this book is really about the arguments for happiness as the priority for a society. Um, and then the evidence on how we could get there and how people in different professions, teachers, um, medics, uh, employers, politicians, economists, and so on, scientists, how they could contribute to it. So that there's, there's something for everybody um, because we all have a, a role to play in building uh, the happier world. Now, I mean, the idea that uh, the goal for society uh, should be happiness the happiness of the people. Uh, it's not a new idea. In fact, uh, 200 years ago, uh, most civilized people in Britain and North America would have said that that's pretty obvious. Um, but somehow or other, um, it's taken a long time to get this uh, idea really to sink in. And I think the big change that's happened in the last 30 or 40 years is that we've got the science of happiness. So we can now not just speculate about the causes of happiness, but actually uh, estimate what they are in a proper quantitative way. And I'm sure we'll, we'll come to, to, to some of that. Um, but what, what, what I really want to see happening is that policymakers, uh, which doesn't just mean people in government and local government, but people who run um, NGOs, uh, people and people who run businesses and so on, that they should be focusing um, on the impact of their decisions on happiness, happiness of all the people uh, that could be potentially affected by, the, by their decisions. Um, and that they should be obviously thinking of that 
when we're talking about, say, a, a budget holder, uh, thinking about that um, relative to the cost of each different way of improving people's happiness. So that we would, when we talk about the bang for the buck, what do we mean by the bang? By the bang, we mean the change in the happiness of the people um, relative to the money that's being spent on it. And yet you can see, and we'll come to this, what a, a completely different set of public priorities you'd be getting uh, if that was really what your objective was. But of course, that's a top-down approach to this. There's also the bottom-up approach, how each of us actually lead our own lives and what our own objectives are. And I think that we really do need a, a change of culture. Uh, there are elements of it. But if you ask sort of what is the basic objective um, which our society is setting young people these, these days, um, I suppose you would say it is really personal success um, to do as well as you can compared with other people. And if you think about this, this is a simple logical point. If, if your happiness depends on how you do compared with other people, every time somebody does better, somebody else does worse. So it, there is no way we could have a happier society if we continue with this idea that personal success is the right objective for the way that the individual should live. We have to get away from what, what, what we would call in the jargon a zero sum objective to a positive sum objective where we're getting more of our happiness from creating happiness for other people. So um, quite a bit of the book is about, you know, how can we rethink of our, think about ourselves as creators of happiness? And people who, of course, experience it themselves, but mainly experience it themselves because of creating it for other people as well. So it's, it's a book about um, change of culture, uh, some of which is already happening, but uh, COVID is a great opportunity uh, to rethink it all. Um, and, and then it's a book about evidence in support of the change of culture. Yeah, thank you for, for doing such a wonderful job laying out kind of the ideas behind the book, the impetus and sort of what the problem is as well. It's important to diagnose the problem that we're trying to fix, I think. So thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to ask right away if you would get into definitions a little bit. I think a lot of us have a hard time um, thinking of defining these kind of slippery concepts like happiness and well-being, but you do such a good job of that. And I wondered um, if you could elaborate for our audience on how you've defined and or measured things like happiness, not only in the, in the ind individual, but also in society at large. Well, uh, happiness is, is, is uh, an inner experience. It's how you feel. Um, and uh, I think that um, we should be very clear about that. We're talking about uh, how people feel about their lives, um, do they feel good and want to go on feeling like that? Or do they feel bad and wanting things to be very different? Um, so of course it's a scale, um, it's, it's like temperature. Um, it, it, it has a big range. Um, uh, and we can of course then study what, what is causing this enormous range. Now, what is a question that one should use? The question which is most often used uh, is, uh, Overall, how satisfied are you with your life these days? And this is a question which I think is, is, is put right because it's letting the person judge for themselves what is important to them. We're not saying, do you have what you need? And I'll tell you what you need is this, that and the other. We're saying, given the person you are and what you feel you need, how are you doing uh, relative to it? So it's democratic in that sense. Um, and I think it's also one that policymakers are, are quite willing to accept because they're used to asking people, you know, are you satisfied with your fire service or your school? And so it's not too far to move, are you satisfied with your life? Which of course um, is what ultimately any, as I said, any decision maker should be aiming to help people to have lives that they find satisfying and fulfilling and, and inspiring. So uh, it, it's, if you like, life satisfaction, that's the shorthand, um, is the most commonly 
used measure, and that's the one which I, I, I use really throughout that book. Um, I try to stick to one, one measure. Um, we know a huge amount about what is causing that. But it, uh, I'd like just to address the issue. People say, oh, but it's only subjective. Only subjective. <laughs> I mean, what could be more important than how people feel? Uh, why is it more important? Um, you know how many square feet I have. Then some uh, those are those are sort of objective measures. How many square feet I have? Um, do I have a partner um, that I love? Do I have a job I love? And so on. These are, these are things. Leaving out the I love bit, which of course becomes subjective. But do do I have? Can can it be shown I've got a job with a good income or a partner or a, a nice house? These are the objective measures. Obviously, they're trivial compared with how the person actually feels about all of those things. Um, so uh, we, 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 we should be very, very firm with people say it's only subjective. Now, that's what is so important about it, that it is subjective. Um, but we can measure it, as I ju just said. Now, then the question is, can you believe the answers? Um, and there are at least uh, four reasons for believing these answers. The first <laughs> is that um, the neuroscientists uh, can measure um, brain activity in relevant parts of the brain. That is an objective measurement. And they can show that that is correlated with the way people answer these questions. So that's one, uh, I think, important piece of uh, of, of confirmatory evidence. Others are, um, you can ask people's friends how happy they think the person is, that's quite well correlated with how happy the person says they are. Um, you can look at how happy people are as a prediction of how they'll behave, like the most striking one is, is will they die or not? How happy people are uh, is a much better predictor of, of uh, whether they uh, will die in the next 10 years than any other variable, uh, more a better predictor than smoking or even than most forms of medical diagnosis. Uh, so it's, it's, it's obviously a lot of information content in what people say when they just answer that single question, how happy they are. Um, it, it predicts how they'll vote better than their economic status, all kinds of things. Uh, predicts their productivity, which is pretty important from the businessman's point of view. Uh, and then finally, of course, we can explain it by uh, plausible things that explain it. So um, I think it's a, it, it, the, there is a lot of information content uh, in what people say and answer these questions. Absolutely. And I have to add that for any skeptics, once you pick up the book, you'll just see how, how rich it is in graphs and data. And I think that Richard's done a wonderful job laying all of this out for us, but in a really digestible manner as well. So, so thank you for that. Um, you. So <laughs> my next question is, um, is related to some of your work with um, other other professionals in the fields of mind training, positive psychology. One of the things that I really enjoyed about the book is that you you give your readers so many paths to to go down in order to start kind of on this journey towards a, a greater engagement with happiness. And so you mentioned the work of different researchers and public figures. Um, some of the ones that stuck out to me and whose work I, I was already familiar with include His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, Martin Seligman, Matthew Ricard, Richard Davidson. I mean, they're just a whole host of wonderful people as well as an index of researchers who were working on these issues right now. Um, so I, I wondered if I could ask you what it was like to, to work with some of these um, individuals in, in various fields and not just kind of in your own economic terrain. <laughs> well, it was a great uh, journey of discovery, I must say. Actually, well, the first person I met uh, was somebody that uh, you also know um, from the University uh, of Michigan. Um, and um, he's called Richard Davidson, and he studies the neuroscience of meditation. Uh, and I've, I visited uh, his lab, and I was really impressed by, by these findings of the correlation between what people say about their experience and the measurements that can actually be made uh, on the brain. The next thing that actually happened to me was that I got an email from Nepal, from a, a monk in Nepal, 
saying that, <laughs> that Richard Davidson had told him that there was this, this odd economist um, who was trying to learn about happiness. And so the next thing was actually Mathieu uh, Ricard came to our house uh, and I got to, to be, a, be a, a real friend with him, which was nice. And then of course, through him, um, I got to know uh, the Dalai Lama, um, who's a, a, not only a wonderful person, as you probably know, uh, but he's also a, a, a very thoughtful and well-informed person with a, a strong scientific bent of mind. So all of these people actually belong to a network called the Mind and Life Institute, um, which is, is a, uh, a, a, a collection of Western neuroscientists, uh, or mainly neuroscientists, um, with uh, Buddhist scholars from the East, including of course, um, His Holiness. Um, so I've, I've been privileged to go to a number of those meetings and spoken at some of them. Uh, and it, it was a wonderful experience. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I found myself sat in, sitting, sitting next to the Dalai Lama at lunch one day. <laughs> so uh, asked him about his daily ritual. You know, he gets up at 3.30 in the morning, meditates for five hours, just just extraordinary but uh, it, he it is is interesting and what he has done and of course what Mathieu Rica has done is you can see how they have have transformed themselves into deeply compassionate people who when they have any interaction with anybody feel this tremendous tremendous sense of fellow feeling with that person now, I wish I could say that I've managed to transform myself uh, 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 as much as they have, but I think it's, it, it's an extraordinarily important thing because uh, actually, um, apart from um, things which are coming from inside ourselves, perhaps the most important thing which is coming from outside ourselves um, is the, the goodwill or lack of it and the trustworthiness and uh, and decency of the people that we interact with. Um, so looking at it now from, <laughs> um, from, the, from, from, the, from the outside, I mean, we have got to somehow make ourselves into those incredibly warm-hearted and decent people uh, like um, the, the Dalai Lama and Machu Rica. Now you also mentioned Martin Seligman who has of course been extraordinarily important because um, ha, 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 well, psychology having very largely been working on the causes of, um, uh, uh, of mental distress and mental disorder um, in the middle of the century. Um, Martin said, well, why, got, why can't we apply some of the same methods to studying um, the causes of, of happiness above the average um, because surely we should be raising uh, everybody uh, if we can uh, using in many cases the same sorts of things that have been discovered for raising people who are at the bottom end um, that the the wisdom coming from cognitive uh, behavioral therapy um, uh, that you, you can train your mind, not just through meditation, but also through habit formation and styles of thinking. Um, and uh, he, he took the advantage of being president of the American uh, Psychological Society um, to propose this new field called positive psychology, which was about, as it were, the upper end and how we can achieve it by, by, by being more positive. Um, and I think that this is, this is also a hugely important um, thing. So we've, we've really got the sort of confluence, haven't we, of the wisdom of the East and the psychology of the West um, offering a, a, a sort of um, reasonably confident routes to, to anybody um, to achieve equanimity and, and the calm of, and peace of mind. Um, but then of course, on top of, on top of that has to be compassion. 
uh, and concern for the peace of mind of others. So th there's, um, and I think um, these two go well together because uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, one of the surest ways of improving your own happiness is to do something nice for somebody else. Um, so th these are not in contrast, this, this attempt to achieve peace of mind for yourself uh, and to create joy and happiness for others. Yeah, thank you for telling us about some of some of your work with uh, with other professors and professionals. I as I'm I'm sitting here thinking about the the network you were describing. I'm I'm almost thinking of your book like a gateway drug. Like it'll get you into this groove <laughs> of learning more about well being and happiness studies. And yeah, yeah. I wanted to highlight for those of you who are French in our audience or French readers, you can of course read. Mathieu Ricard in the original, he is French. He was a molecular biologist who then became a monk and is doing really interesting work. And if you're interested in learning more about meditation, well, I have another prop for you. Here's Richard Davidson mm -hmm. on meditation uh, with Daniel Goleman, of course, um, who, who Richard has just spoken about for us. So feel free to check out these references at the library, or even if you want to borrow them from me, I'd be happy to lend them well, on. Well, I've got, I've got another one. <laughs> oh, do you? On the screen, yeah. <laughs> Because here I received today for the first time the paperback of of the book that we're talking about. Um, so I don't know if it's on Amazon yet, but uh, anyway, I've got it. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. I, I should mention, of course, that the book is right now it's available in hardback. And I think the official publication date for the paperback in the UK is going to be the 28th of January. Right. Um, so yes. that should be available very soon and at, at a much lower price, of course, as uh, as we we'd spoken about earlier. Um, so for the next question, I did want to get back into to your terrain, to your field of economics by introducing this quote that comes pretty early in your book. You write, the fundamental inequality in our society is the inequality of happiness, not of income. And I was really struck by that because I think for so many of us, um, poverty sounds like it should be kind of the, the essential problem of our time and what we should be, what we should be working on tackling. Um, and I hoped you could walk us through the relationship. Um, can we tackle the inequality of, of happiness without tackling other economic inequalities? Or what is the relationship between those two things? Well, um, if you're asking what, is, what causes it, there's, there's a big, a very wide dispersion of happiness in, in any community. Uh, and of course, in the world, it's, it's even wider than within any one country. Um, and some of it is connected with income, but a very small fraction of it is connected with income, even though I worked on income inequality, as you mentioned, uh, for most of my life. Um, the biggest single factors are health, especially mental health. And there I'm not talking about something kind of woolly, like I, 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 I say I'm feeling depressed. I'm talking about a simple question. Have you ever been diagnosed uh, with depression or an anxiety disorder. That, the answer to that question explain more of the misery in certainly in advanced societies uh, than any other variable, much more than say being in the bottom 20% of income. Um, so I think it's obvious that in 20 or 50 years time when people look back uh, on our time, they will be outraged, outraged by the amount of of economic inequality. But I think they'd be even more outraged with a completely outrageous neglect of mental health. Um, as I'm sure you know, um, if you're physically ill, you, you, in most certainly advanced countries, you get treated. Uh, and if you're mentally ill, you don't get treated. Um, the um, Britain's got the highest rate of treatment of mentally ill people is 40%. But in most advanced countries, it's under a third of, of people who, in a household survey, ha have the, the, the uh, characteristics that would lead to a diagnosis of mental illness. Uh, under a third of them are in treatment. Um, I mean, this is deeply shocking. Uh, and um, the... Um, and the other obvious thing is that they don't get the treatment they want because most of them would like psychological therapy, um, which is uh, as effective or more effective than uh, drugs 
uh, for most mental health conditions, um, or certainly for common mental disorders like depression or anxiety disorders. Um, and, and in fact, uh, most people are fobbed off with um, drugs. Generally, in the case of Britain, uh, where we have got a very good system of guidelines for mental health treatments, um, the majority of the drugs that are given are given to people for whom they would not be recommended by the government guidelines. <laughs> they do it, some, it's a way of getting somebody out of the doctor's door, give them a, give them a pill. Um, and it's, it's kind of deeply shocking. And the lives that are being wasted on that score uh, and actually, a lot, of course, a good, a good part of poverty is caused by mental illness. I know that there's also some cause, causal going the other way from poverty to mental illness, but it's more, it's bigger going from mental illness to poverty. So um, mental illness is, is the, the, the biggest neglected um, area. Um, but of course, the, the other set of causes other than health which are more important than income, are, are human relationships. Uh, and I think if, if any of us are honest, um, maybe, maybe we in this particular audience are, are rather privileged economically, but um, I think uh, it's found in fact in surveys, if you ask people what they worry about, they mainly worry about their about relationships, not about money or debt. Uh, politicians assume they worry about money or debt, but they mainly worry about their relationships um, in the family, including with their parents, uh, their partner and their children. Um, conflict there is a cause of incredible unhappiness. Um, they're worried about uh, relationships at work and, and also having work. Having work is a very important um, thing for a society to ensure. If you want work, you should be able to find it. Um, and then the third and least important is the relationships in the community, but these are still very important to people, whether they feel safe, whether they feel the community is, is friendly. Uh, and actually, all of those relationship variables explain more of the spread of the inequality of happiness that you started the question with um, than the spread of, of, of income. So um, it, it, it is, it's a kind of materialism that has led to this excessive focus on income. Um, and, and, you know, it's easy to measure and <laughs> things like that. Um, whereas, um, and you might think it's easy, easy to correct income inequality. And, and um, certainly I, I'm a huge believer in redistribution of income. But we, we now have, and this is, I think, the main point, really, that I want to make about, about the state of this situation. We now have evidence about how to tackle all these other problems. We have evidence about how to tackle not just mental health problems that I mentioned before, but family conflict. We, we know how to help families that are in conflict. We also need how to, we know how to um, prevent family conflict or make it much less likely through good uh, antenatal classes where the parent, both the parents uh, are, are there and are, are learning about the kinds of problems that arise once you have a child in the relationship between the two parents. The, these are fun, really, really, really important things. Then in schools, of course, we have to teach children the, the secrets of, of, of a happy life and a life that contributes to the happiness of others. Uh, and this, this can be done in a completely evidence-based way. Evidence -based way. Um, I've been involved with a program um, called Healthy Minds, but you need at least an hour a week devoted to the basic learning of these, these skills. Um, obviously, there's a lot that can be done at work. Um, a lot of work environments cause, cause mental illness and distress. Um, but there's also a lot, of course, that, that uh, employers can do to help people who have mental health problems to make sure they get 
that the help they need, and so on and so on. I mean, I can, I, I'm <laughs> not going through chapter by chapter, <laughs> but when we, I've, I've said a little bit about the inequality of uh, of happiness, um, but it is a good way of identifying problems, the, the, the things that cause, uh, that contribute most to explaining the inequality of happiness, surely should be our priority areas for uh, addressing. So we should be addressing um, problems of, of, uh, of mental illness, but also what can be done to prevent it, what can be done to produce uh, work environments that make people uh, feel better and so on, as well as income inequality. Right. And let's go back for a moment to unemployment. Um, you mentioned it in the beginning, as well as in this in this last answer. Um, we're a lot of us are thinking about that issue right now with the with the mass unemployment we've seen Absolutely. in the COVID. Um, I, I don't mean to be doom and gloom, but of course it's something that's important to to discuss. And I think you you do a great job of that. At one point, you share that people lose an average of seven tenths of a point out of ten on their kind of satisfaction scale or their happiness scale if they are unemployed. And this is comparable to losing a spouse or facing a separation or divorce or something like that. I think we can't take that issue seriously enough. Um, and is that something that you, that you expect to be doing more work on going forward? Yes, of course, we've got this issue in Britain as you have in France um, uh, and, uh, and obviously the US also. Um, this, this is actually going to get a lot worse. Uh, and um, I, I've been involved with this right back to the, re the, the recessions in the early 80s. Uh, and I always felt that given how, the, how humiliating it is to be, be unwanted and, and unable to find work, we, sh we ought not to allow anybody to remain in that condition more than a year. So back in the 80s, actually, I, I led a movement for a job guarantee uh, to anybody who's unemployed for over a year. Uh, and I still feel this is the correct way to do it. Um, and now, some people say, of course, you, you'd offer people jobs um, and, and not continue to offer them unemployment benefit. Um, some people say um, that's um, not good for their happiness. <laughs> Why not let them choose between unemployment benefit uh, and having the job? Uh, the, the, here, here's another a fact. I mean, people can get into a state um, of, of depression and helplessness where they can't imagine things getting any better. Um, but what has been found in all these job schemes, um, and it's been found in Germany, it's been found in Britain, that uh, if you uh, offer a person um, uh, uh, work at, at, the, at the minimum wage, uh, they uh, f feel better, even if you have removed from them the, the alternative of, of remaining on the dole. Uh, and I think this is a very, very important principle. I think it's a principle which ought to be able to unite left and right. And um, we've, we've certainly pushed these job schemes. We, we've not got any go government to follow, <coughs> follow, <coughs> fully do that. Um, I think that the Danes are the nearest, but um, we've had major job schemes in Britain, which I've been associated with um, in all the, all the recent recessions. Um, and and uh, we're, we're now moving into a phase where the same sort of thing happens in Britain. And I hope, hope it can happen in France. I haven't been following that, but um, I think France has very high unemployment, or always has had a high unemployment because it do doesn't um, um, make the same effort to get unemployed people into work <clears throat> rather than uh, li live on the, the guaranteed minimum income. Uh, as other countries like Denmark or Germany or Britain. Right, so you, you give people some economic prosperity or something to live with, but yet no purpose, right? So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the problems of, 
of initiatives like that. Um, well, let's move on to something a little bit uh, of a brighter spot in your book, which is your discussion of altruism and altruistic deeds. Um, I think a lot of readers might be surprised to, to learn that uh, these that altruism really does make us happier when we're doing nice things for other people, we have a tangible benefit from that. And so it's this kind of concept of selfish selflessness that I, mm. I love to read about. Um, I wondered if you could tell us how this works and a little bit more about how your findings about that are incorporated into the book. Yes, well, well there's a little experiment that um, some people that I know did, where some people were given money to spend on themselves and other people were given money to spend on, on other people. Um, and they were all asked actually beforehand, which they thought they would prefer to be. They were randomly allocated, which they preferred. And they all thought they would prefer to be given money to spend on themselves. Um, but at the end, it turned out the people who had been given money to spend on other people um, were much happier than the people who had been given money to spend on themselves. Uh, so there are, there are these kind of, uh, of experiments, but of course there's always, because uh, it's always slightly difficult to establish causality in these things. But there's a general fact that um, people who on various grounds are assessed as more altruistic either in terms of things they say about themselves but even more uh, when you get other people to assess them are also on average happier so that, that correlation across people that unselfish people are on the whole happier and i think it's pretty obvious that preoccupation with self is actually one of the the, the, the most uh, misery inducing things so uh yeah um it, it, it's uh we, we have some big problems about this in our society at the moment there's a lot of idealism amongst young people but the social media are making people so preoccupied with the way in which they project themselves um that we've got now a really huge increase in mental illness especially amongst uh women between 15 and 25 this is a really serious problem and the, the timing of it and some experimental evidence makes it highly likely that this is basically coming from the social media. Right. And shifting then to think about um, the role of trust and social support in a happy society. So I think, you know, many of us come with the assumption that things like um, healthcare systems or employment or economic prosperity would be among the most important factors in determining individual happiness. And yet, as you argue, we really see that trust and social support are fundamental to people's sense of well-being. Um, what do you think that we can do to build and encourage these qualities locally? Well, um, let me just mention the evidence for what you just said. Um, because I didn't mention it before. Um, of course, the evidence of the effects of culture of the kind that you're talking about, uh, trust, generosity, also things like freedom, corruption, all these things. Uh, you can only get evidence on that really by comparing countries. So um, I'm uh, one of the editors of uh, the World Happiness Report that comes out uh, on March the 20th which incidentally, I hope you've all got in your diaries, International Day of Happiness. Uh, on March the 20th, uh, my colleague John Halliwell always includes an analysis of what explains the ranking of countries, because the Scandinavian countries are always at the top. And then come countries like uh, Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, or quite often New Zealand, Canada. Um, and these countries are much higher in trust um, than, uh, than other countries. And it seems to be you know, a historical phenomenon, a basic deep cultural phenomenon as to whether the culture has basically encouraged people to try and demonstrate how different they are from other people, um, which I think of as a sort of Anglo-Saxon <laughs> version of personal success as the goal, or whether you, you're always you're told you should look for what you have in common with other people, and which is rather puritan, slightly puritanical, but it doesn't have to be very puritanical. And that's much more the sort of central message that you get if you go to school in Scandinavia that you should look look for what you have in common with other people. And I, I think that 
th this comes back to the general cultural phenomenon we were talking about. Um, but I think if you if you're if you're growing up to think what you can contribute to the lives of others, it, you will just have a, a better and happier society than if you're uh, brought up thinking what you can get for yourself. And I think now might be a, a good time also for if you'd like to do a plug for Action for Happiness at all. We'd, I wanted to. I've been wanting to do that all the time. <laughs> I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> well. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, and, and, and I thought I thought of bringing it in when you mentioned the Dalai Lama, yeah. um, because he's our patron, uh, and we got him uh, to to launch our course. But I'll tell you the general the idea of action happens um, is really that um, to lead the kind of life that we've been saying um, people need to live, it's not easy. I mean, it's easy, so easy to lose your sense of perspective. Um, and you need uh, really to get together regularly with people um, who have the same values as yourself um, to be inspired and to be sustained uh, uh, and supported and, uh, and gen generally um, uplifted. Um, and I, I, I thought that to an extent uh, people used to get this. Um, from going to church, but not many Europeans go to church anymore. Um, it, it certainly provided uh, uh, the kind of um, uplifting experience where there, I think there are two aspects to it. One is a feeling that you're, you're not as important as you thought. <laughs> and really the, world, the, the great world, world out there. Um, uh, and it's not so desperate what happens to you, but also that, in, that in, in, at some level you feel supported and that in some sense all, all shall be well. Um, so, so we need um, an organizations uh, where people get together regularly with like-minded people around, around these issues to be inspired. Um, so the way Action for Happiness works is that these groups, um, we've got groups now all over the world, these groups start with a course, which used to be until COVID face to face, and uh, eight session course, um, going through what we call the 10 keys of happiness, um, with evidence, but also with a huge amount of shared experience, um, uh, 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 and, uh, and so on. Um, we did a, a, a randomized controlled trial of this, uh, <clears throat> where some people uh, were, uh, had to wait until they took the course. And so we compared the people who took the course to the people who didn't take the course. And the people who took the course got, you mentioned, uh, uh, seven-tenths of a point for unemployment. These people got a whole point increase in happiness uh, as a result of taking the course. And so incidentally, the people who had waited when they eventually took the course. So. I mean, this is extraordinary. Um, of course, these are people who, who are, are seeking. That's why they, they come to this. Um, but it, it is really making a difference to them. And um, we, we are, are really hoping that um, we'll be able to reach um, hundreds of thousands, well, we, online, of course, we reach over a million people, all of that, but we want to want to reach in a sense of when we can all get together physically, we want to reach hundreds of thousands of people getting together regularly in, in these groups um, worldwide. Um, because I think we really can make a difference to people um, in, 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 in that way. Great, thank you for that. And I've just um, included a link in the chat box uh, if anybody's interested in learning more about Action for Happiness, the website is there. Okay, well, Richard, thank you for this conversation about the book. And I think we'll move to audience questions now. Yes, absolutely. And I already have a few, which is great. And please, if you do have one, feel free to, to submit it in the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can with the time mm. remaining. All right, so the first one um, is somebody who'd like you to speak more about the correlation between happiness and longevity. Yes, well, the, um, the, the, the best evidence that I know actually comes from the 
the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, um, where uh, someone called Andrew Steptoe um, measured people's happiness. So this, is a, this is a random sample of people aged over 50. Um, and he, he measured people's happiness at the beginning of the survey. And then they were followed and they saw how many of them uh, died in the next nine years. And three times, if you divide the population into three, according to how happy that the, they were at the beginning of the period, uh, the least happy third people were three times as likely to die, literally three times as likely to die as the most happy third. Now you can then control for some other factors, but a great deal of that uh, can only be explained by the happiness. There's also, there've been a number of studies actually, there's been um, a study in uh, Norway and, and elsewhere. Um, people have also, of course, studied the effect of, of, of mental health, um, which is uh, only, only a part of, of happiness, obviously. Uh, it's been found um, in one of the, this Norwegian study, a very careful one, that uh, depression um, is um, as good a predictor of the likelihood of death as, as whether you're a smoker, for example. So these inner states, <laughs> they're subjective, <laughs> but they are very real. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next one is about COVID. I, I mean, uh, you, well, you, you don't want me to go on about the medic, medical <laughs> side of that, but I mean, you know some of the mechanisms this goes through, don't you? The, 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 the bad effects of stress on the whole functioning of the human body. Right, of course, that's important to bring to bring that mm -hmm. into it. It's not only unhappiness, but I mean, you you deal so much with other sorts of mental illness in the book and anxiety and stress, as you mentioned. So I think those are those are equally right. important. That's right. Right. Um, so the next question is, how do you think COVID-19 is going to affect or change our priorities in life? Can this crisis make us actually happier as a society in the long term? Well, brilliant question. Um, I mean, that's what we're hoping. <laughs> and, and I think a number of things have certainly happened in COVID. Um, I would think one thing is that people have really reflected on what are the most important things to them um, because um, they've been quite challenged. Everybody has been fairly heavily challenged and has had to fall back on the things which are, are most important and they found uh, thing, new things that they've learned about themselves um, as to, to what's, what's most important. So that's one good thing. Um, I, th I think, uh, an, uh, an, another really important thing has been that there has been a, de a degree of social solidarity of a kind we haven't experienced, say in Britain since the Second World War, uh, that we that people are feeling that we're all in it together, and that somehow that's uh, that idea that um, we actually share an awful lot together. We're not just little atoms bouncing around, but we uh, we can. Uh, do better if we have more of a sense of sharing a, 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 a common purpose um, with our fellow citizens. That, that, that has also come up. Um, it, it links a bit with what we were saying about Scandinavia and so on. There's, there's a bit more of that. Uh, those kind of values, I think, have been spreading in other countries. Um, a, th a third thing, which is at a different level, but an important thing which has emerged from this is that all kinds of things can be done which nobody ever thought could be done. <laughs> I mean, governments, governments can uh, spend money on things that they would never have ever considered spending money on before. And all kinds of things, I mean, firms or, or, or employers have had to reorganize their, their working arrangements in ways they would never have thought possible before and so on. So there's a, a whole sort of new world out there to an extent uh, um, able to be created. And I think we've got the right ideas and we can create it uh, if we can get these ideas accepted. Right, and I think that cooperation also has huge ramific ramifications for how we're considering tackling the challenge of climate change. And of I know course. you're you're a proponent of clean energy and that's a whole separate, you know, we could speak for another hour just about that. So we maybe could, we could indeed. We won't yeah. get into it, but. <laughs> But yeah, that's another um, positive thing we, we could take from the current challenge, certainly. 
Um, so the next question is, uh, let me summarize this here. Have you studied what the effect would be of giving everyone a universal basic income? And I, I do know that you you do talk about that in the book, so I'll, I'll let <laughs> you respond to that. I'm not enthusiastic about that. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm for two reasons. For, first, that uh, um, I mean, if you if you wanted to provide a decent guarantee for, for the poorest people that way, uh, the tax rate would have to be so exorbitant that it's just in, unimaginable. But I, I also, I'm slightly doubtful about the ethical basis of it, because I do think that the idea, um, I mean, income doesn't just happen. It does happen because people work. That, that, that's, it, income doesn't grow in trees, it does come from work. Um, and I think the idea that um, people should feel entitled to, to an income without working, even if they could work, doesn't seem to be right. And it's quite, it doesn't fit in with the general ethics that I've been talking about. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, so the next one here is, do studies show a difference in people's assessment of their happiness over time? And this, this person says, when I was much younger, I would have said feeling free and independent would make me happy. Now that I'm retired and living on a fixed and rather small amount uh, income, I think, uh, I think I would be happier if I felt secure, financially secure. So what do studies have to say about that? A shift over, over lifetime and priorities and happiness? Oh, of course there are there are huge changes um which which is, is actually one one good argument for um sort of not trying to establish objective criteria for well-being we actually ask how people feel about their lives but uh, certainly we know um, i've just been reading a wonderful book about the teenage brain i mean uh, the things that give satisfaction to, to teenagers uh, are rather very different from the ones that give satisfaction to um, to, to, um, to older people. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the, there's a good bit, uh, bit known about that. Absolutely, yes. Okay, so we have another question here about those Scandinavians who seem to rank so highly in terms of satisfaction and success right. in their country. Um, so why do the Scandinavians continuously rate so high on the happiness scale despite their weather and hours of darkness in the winter? <laughs> yeah, um, well, you, you see, see, this is interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, what this, this weather thing shows is, is just how superficial many of us are in, in, in thinking about happiness. Uh, and um, th th this, this was shown by, uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Daniel Kahneman, uh, who is a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in Economics. So one of his little studies was um, comparing happiness in, in Minnesota, which is an incredibly cold place in winter, um, with California. Um, so, so he asked people, both in Minnesota and in, in California, where they thought people were happier. And of course, they, they all thought that people were happier in California than they were in Minnesota. But he, he, he then separately actually surveyed the happiness, the actual happiness of people in Minnesota and California with no difference. Um, it's, it's very easy to, to really get a very distorted idea of what's really important for humans. So, so when you were, I think the question was about, also about, about the Scandinavian situation. Um, I think I've, I've said perhaps a, a, a enough about that, but um, I, I think what, what is really clear is that the, the cultures and value systems are very central to the happiness of the people. Um, and, and it's very important to get away from sort of mechanical ideas that it's simply just, you know, what 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 you have of this that and the other ingredient right absolutely <clears throat> um i have another really interesting question here so what about the effect of populism on happiness or even brexit turning inward rather than outward does this generate happiness or is it something else i thought your question would be the other way around well <laughs> what's the effect of happiness on populism 
Um, I can answer that question, but I'll try and answer yours in a moment. But uh, one of my colleagues has been studying this a lot, uh, and actually it's becoming quite a subject, a uh, small sub-subject within the well-being field. Um, it, it comes through very clearly that the people who support populist parties are, are on average, a lot more discontented, you know, unhappy people um, than the rest of the population. And um, th this, um, I mean, this is, this is a, <laughs> a pretty important reason why politicians uh, should be taking happiness seriously as an objective if they want to defeat populism apart from anything else. Um, uh, and we haven't talked about that, but let me just mention it in passing. Uh, I think I did refer to it, but we, we've got a lot of very good evidence now that how happy people are um, has a very strong effect on whether they vote for the incumbent government when it comes up for re-election. Um, so, which is, is, is why I'm very confident that this agenda will, will eventually become the agenda of politicians because it's in their interest. If they want to get re-elected, they'd better take happiness and well-being really seriously. But now, your, your question was not whether happiness creates populism, but does populism create happiness? I mean, I, 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 I just this morning was talking with a colleague because I think we need to find out what, what happened to the happiness of um, people in different parts of America when Trump got elected. Um, certainly, if a populist wins, people <laughs> people who were supporting populism obviously become happier. Um, but I'm not not quite sure whether that's that's what the question is. I mean, uh, I, I think if if we don't think populism is a good idea, we're not going to think it improves the happiness of the whole population. But it may improve the happiness of bits of the population. They they probably enjoyed storming the capital. Well, on that topic, we're certainly hoping for a peaceful day tomorrow. So <laughs> let's, let's all send out right. peaceful vibes to to America. We can work on our meditation practice and exactly, get exactly. through the next next couple of days. Um, well, I, 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 hope, I hope Biden is, is, is maintaining <laughs> his equanimity. <laughs> yeah. If I can just sneak in one last audience question here, is that all right? Yes, please. Okay, great. So um, this person has asked. For organizations or nonprofits uh, that have in their mission to improve the lives and livelihoods through employment, health, affordable housing, arts, food security, do you suggest that these organizations need to add the word happiness in their mission? And what would that do or change? Absolutely, very much. So um, I think every organization um, should think that the, uh, its only purpose and raise on debt and legitimate objective really is to improve the happiness of mankind humankind um in whatever way they can and and they seriously and of course now we've got certainly in britain organizations that are setting themselves up to help charities measure the impact of their uh, activities on happiness uh, which is hopefully what they'll all do both in retrospect if we're looking at how well they're doing, but also, of course, in prospect when deciding how to spend uh, their money. So yes, it's um, this. This should be the mission for for everybody. And, and I, I, we haven't talked much about business, but I don't think we can think that there's a, um, a legitimation of business, except on the basis that it is contributing to human happiness. And it, it really is rather encouraging. One of the best things that's happened in the last two years, quite a shift in business opinion toward the view that they actually are responsible for the happiness of their workers and not just the shareholders. This is a huge step forward and the customers. So if we could get this kind of, of idealistic view into every organization, every school, that's, that schools are not just about getting people to pass exams, but to become emerge as rounded and happy humans. Um, businesses, if that we could get businesses 
uh, to think this way and if we can get governments to think this way. Um, I think we can have a happier world. Thank you. I think that's a that's a wonderful point to end on. So thank you so much, Professor Lord Laird, for being with us this evening and for sharing your your thoughts and insights with our community. This has been tremendously valuable, and it's really been an honor for me to speak with you. So thank you for that. Well, th thank you for your questions, <laughs> Catherine, and thank you also to uh, your listeners for those, those very interesting questions. And um, well, let, let's let's see let's see what we can do to make the place better. <laughs> Fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I will also close out by saying, um, by reminding everybody rather that the American Library in Paris is a nonprofit organization. And typically in person for events, we welcome about 10 euros per person per event um, as far as a donation. So if you're interested in supporting the library, I do encourage you to uh, look back in that email that I sent around with the Zoom link and you'll find a link to donate and to support the library um, that you can use tonight if you'd like to do that. Um, yes, thank you again to our audience for your engagement and for your wonderful questions this evening. And thank you, of course, to our sponsor as well, Grow at Annenberg. And thank you again, Richard, and I hope everybody has a lovely evening and we hope to see you again very soon at another program. Well, I want to come, to come and see your library. <laughs> you have a standing <laughs> invitation here in Paris. We would love that. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye, right. everyone. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.